Nisha Gill, welcome to the Activating Consciousness podcast. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to it. No, it's a pleasure. It's literally all mine. And I'm going to give a quick shout out to Barry O'Kane, who was sort of a catalyst, I think, in some way for this discussion, because you and I and he at Meaning a few years ago just went down this incredible rabbit hole for an hour. And I'm not sure I've come back up again yet, Lisa. <laughs> Yeah, I just remember us in a corner in the, in that pub, surrounded by other people, just like in this really deep, meaningful conversation. And it was just gorgeous. Amazing. Well, look, as we get going, would you mind giving our listeners a bit of an overview of to you know, who is Lisa and what do you do? Like really, really like simple questions this, uh, this Friday. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um so I, I guess in terms of my work, I describe myself as a coach primarily. So I work with people who are interested in um, working without managers is kind of the simplest way to explain it. So I coach people and teams in how to do that in terms of the skills, the mindset, and sometimes helping with kind of structures and processes. Um, and I have my own podcast, as you know, Lead Amorphosis. So I'm really interested in kind of a journalistic aspect as well, like exploring examples and stories of new ways of working and being together. Um, so that's professional me anyway. <laughs> so, so, so give us a bit more. So who is whole, Lisa? Which, <laughs> which, which bit of you have you not shared with us yet? So I'd, I'd love to make a bit more of a personal how did you get into this work? I'm really intrigued because we'll come back to the work you do because I think it's so critical and relevant for this podcast. But you know, what, what was the sort of the lit, what was that little kindling that set you off on this journey towards sort of organisations without managers? I'd love to learn about that today. Yeah, so I was reflecting on this today actually and realizing I think there are two things that kind of led me uh, down this path. Really, the first is that. Um, I grew up in Southeast Asia, so I left England when I was five and my parents moved over to Hong Kong and then Kuala Lumpur and then Singapore. So from the ages of five to 18, that's where I lived. So I think what that shaped was kind of my identity as a cultural outsider in a way. And I became an observer and from quite a young age, I was like a bit of a geeky journalist and writer. Like I was writing little reports on things like the Hong Kong handover and stuff, not as homework assignments or anything, but just for fun. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I think I've always been interested in, yeah, kind of observing from the edges. And so I think that shaped me a lot. And the second thing I think the catalyst was being a frustrated employee. So I, I originally studied drama at university and for a while I thought I wanted to be an actress or at least work in the arts and that didn't really work out because I found it quite challenging to really kind of get into that industry in a meaningful way and found like the creative industry surprisingly uncreative if you're at the bottom of the food chain um, and then worked in a whole bunch of different jobs trying to find my thing and my purpose and always wanting to get involved in things I'm quite creative and found it really frustrating that because I wasn't a manager I wasn't allowed to get involved in certain things that affected me and that really irritated me so I became a bit of a rebel I think and I left quite a few companies and I tried to shake up a few and in the end decided to to leave and set up my own company and and was inspired by books like Reinventing Organizations by Frederick Laloux um, and people like Perry Timms, who you know, who were kind of part of this movement of people who were like, hey, let's reinvent work, let's make it more human, let's make it more collaborative. And I thought, yeah, that seems interesting to me and started kind of reading a lot of books and going to events and talking to people and exploring how could we do that. And so kind of extension of that then became stories and examples of organisations that were really doing radical things and working without managers. Um, and realizing that that actually wasn't that new of an idea, but had somehow been forgotten or something, you know, I thought that was interesting. So cool. <clears throat> Little shout out to Perry. Uh, again, Perry, the super connector. Like, how did I find <laughs> out about you because of Perry, Tim? So thank you, Perry. Um, I'm really, I love that sort of, 
that interplay between that outside of you, yeah, growing up in Hong Kong and this sort of almost disruptive energy that you that emerged through you. And I just wonder if there was maybe not a causation, but some correlation between that. And I'm just making something up at the, in this moment, but I'm just wondering how they may have informed each other somehow. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I guess, I guess like when I was an employee, when I started my career, I was always, I, I suppose I was always looking for ways to belong. And I was trying to do that by creating value. And the way that I seemed to be able to do that was by drawing patterns like and conclusions, seeing what was going on in the culture and the relationships and things like that, and kind of feeding that back to managers. So I became this kind of um, voice of the people in a way, <laughs> for good and for bad. Um, and I remember thinking about 10 years ago or so, like uh, I was doing all of this stuff on the side of my actual day job because I was a project manager at the time. But I was thinking, I was kind of, being uh, recognized and appreciated for doing all of this kind of internal cultural stuff and I remember thinking like why can't that just be my job because I like that and I'm good at that like wouldn't it be fun if I could just make that my job <laughs> and at the time it seemed like well no that's ridiculous how could that ever be a job <laughs> and now it's basically what I do but yeah I think it was I think it was the fact that I was sort of always out slightly outside and observing things and seeing patterns and seeing I've always been quite good at empathizing or being curious about hmm I wonder why that person doesn't feel like they can speak up about that or I wonder why there's such a gap between what managers know is going on and what's actually happening in reality you know on the shop floor so to speak so I was very curious about that and very curious from a rebellious sense of like, why, why can't we just involve people? Why can't we just ask them? <laughs> you know, there was this one project where a group of managers were kind of get asking me for input on what well-being um, kind of uh, perks should we uh, create, decide on for, for the employees? Uh, you know, we were thinking this, 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 this. And I was like, well, why don't you ask people? And it was like this radical thing where they're like, well, I don't think we should do that because what if they suggest something stupid and what if they suggest something that we can't do? And I was like, well, I mean, they're adults. Like, I think they could handle it. <laughs> so I found that very curious. I think I ruffled some feathers. And I, and I can see also that I was a bit, I was probably one of those irritating millennials that I hear people complain about now, where like entitled and sort of, you know, complaining, and I think I would approach it differently now. But I think the impulse, the intention was positive. I really love that. And I <clears throat> think the thing that's really coming up for me as you describe that, Lisa, is that you know, who's making the comment that it's those millennials or they feel entitled? Yeah, well, quite. <laughs> and, um, and I think, I mean, it, it, that's a whole other topic, I think, of, you know, these labels that we give to different generations and are they valid are they useful you know what are kind of universally human things and what are you know things that are influenced by our different cultural contexts and socialization and stuff mm, that's really beautiful and I, and I love this it's really coming up powerfully how systemically you see the world and that's really, really interesting because, you know, this podcast, as you know, is, is very much focused on that lens. And I find it curious. I, I love you. You've used the word curious so many times and I get excited by human beings <laughs> that do that because it's something that I'm finding myself again in the last five years because we sort of very innocently, haven't we, particularly in the West, sort of given that curiosity away almost from birth very innocently through, you know, home life, education, world of work. By the time you hit work, it's like, oh, oh, where's it all gone? <laughs> you have to be curious once. And it seems like the world's really waking up to like, actually, that's the very skill, human behavior. We need to navigate change as business as usual. And I'm just wondering if you'd confirm or deny that, or how does that show up in your work around, around that sort of, what I feel is a very real shift towards curiosity being critical and not just a nice to have now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, I hope one of the things that comes out of this whole pandemic 
is that it's causing us to question things because a lot of companies had to go kind of remote almost overnight. I think a lot of them started questioning, well, hang on a minute, like what do managers actually do? You know, if, if people are working from home, you know, what about that assumption that people need to be supervised or they need to have constant contact with their managers or, um, or they need to be in the office for them to be productive, you know, hmm, that doesn't seem to be happening. Like actually we seem to be doing okay. Um, and I hope that that's, I think it's happening in some instances. Um, I think some companies are going the other way and becoming even more controlling. But I think at least some companies are saying, well, hang on, like, let's not go back to normal when we when this is all over. Let's actually use this as an opportunity to say, like, what are the things that have never really been working or have, been, have for a long time been pretty dysfunctional or unnecessary, needlessly bureaucratic? And let's like reinvent those. Let's not just go back to the default just because that's what we were before. Um, so I think that has provided a bit of a catalyst for more curiosity perhaps like what does good leadership look like like how do you be a good leader when you don't see your team regularly when you can't rely on bumping into them spontaneously you know uh, in the kitchen or in a lunch break or whatever like you have to be so much more intentional about relationships and creating like a a kind of climate of collaboration and um you can't just leave it to chance you know so i think it's really i do a lot of trainings with leaders and they're asking these big questions like how do i support my team how do i uh maintain these strong relationships you know i can't do it by having back-to-back -back zoom calls where all we talk about is you know budgets and projects and deadlines you know um so i think that curiosity piece is really important and you know one of my side passions has always been reinventing education because i think reinventing work without reinventing education is, is kind of pointless that we need to do both um, and as you said i think schools the education system is really designed to kind of squeeze curiosity out of people which is really sad but i've been to some wonderful like alternative schools that are really rethinking what education and what learning could look like and how to teach young people about you know emotional intelligence resilience empathy all of the kind of skills that i think you know professionals leaders humans need and they're learning them at a young age and they're managing them themselves they're directing their own learning so i'm quite hopeful that those generations of of young people will come into workplaces and say, hey, this seems pretty not fit for purpose. Should we maybe try something else? It's really lovely. What I'm feeling as you speak, I love the, the are you going to be writing a book with Frederick Lelou on reinventing education? This might be an exclusive we're getting. <laughs> well, I mean, I have to convince him. I think he's probably not up for it, but but maybe that, yeah, I have been thinking I'd like to write another book and maybe that's, maybe that's it. Put it out to the universe. You might have heard <laughs> it here. Let's see what happens. But, but, but I really, really, <laughs> I really, really love that because this is the this is systemic, this systemic piece again, is that if we only look at work in isolation or education in isolation or our home life in isolation, then that's where we get the friction. And so that's been my journey, as you may have over the five, as I've sort of, like, I've recently added that I'm a reforming human being to my LinkedIn profile, because I found it's the best way of describing who I am. Mm. Like, because so much of what you describe for me around curiosity, you know, learning, self-directed learning, that feels a very innate thing. Like we've already all got it. And it's actually more a case of how do we stay in that curious, innate state more often in a way, you know, leveraging each other's gifts, wisdom, ideas, challenge, debate, etc. But it's not like we need necessarily to go and find something that's over there 3000 miles away. I think a lot of this stuff's internal. Would you agree or challenge or build on that somehow? Yeah, I think so. I think what was coming up for me as you were speaking there is I remember going to a conference quite a few years ago now uh, about emotional intelligence, actually. And there was a really interesting study about empathy 
and and they had they were running this experiment with really young children um like pre toddler age like really little um and basically showing that empathy is inherent like that that we have it when we're born like we're social creatures um empathy is something that we have and it's kind of socialized out of us in a strange way in a similar way that I think curiosity is so I think a lot of the polarization that we see and, and the division that we see and kind of you know fear of the other comes from um a lot of stuff that happens to us depending on where we are in the world and the institutions we're in and the media and all kinds of stuff but it's at our core I think we are empathetic curious creatures and a lot of the a lot of the stuff that I'm doing about new ways of working and being together is really just kind of unlearning a lot of the kind of fear-based stuff that we piled on top of the kind of human essence that we are mm. if, you, if you like um so kind of relearning how to be in relationship with each other instead of this kind of slightly cold professional business jargony persona that many of us are taught is what you're supposed to be like at work you know kind of unlearning that really that's really cool i've got this metaphor in my mind of like a backpack and it's like there's all the old stuff we've been lugging around for generations and actually we don't need to do that anymore we can put it down and as you shared with the last 12 months those beliefs we have to be in the office we can put that belief down now like we don't need to hold on to that anymore so, so I'm hearing sort of like a lot of unlearning, but also a lot of letting go potentially mm. as well. Yeah, exactly. And I, this is maybe a more kind of extreme example, but there's this wonderful documentary. I don't know if you've seen it called Accidental Courtesy. Oh, no. uh, oh it's brilliant. I think you'd love it. It's um, this amazing black musician. He's like in his own right, an incredible jazz musician. Um, but he also has this, rather strange side hobby of um, having conversations with members of the KKK and just being really curious and talking to them human to human and without trying to convince them of anything he's succeeded in converting I think it's like you know maybe nearly a hundred KKK members like having they've left the KKK and he keeps their hoods as kind of a memento that um, you know, he was able to connect with them. So his whole thing is, how can you hate me when you don't know me? Uh, and when you watch the documentary, you see him sitting down with these people and he has gone and learned. He's one of the most knowledgeable people about the history of KKK and what they believe in and all of that stuff. You know, he went and learned about it so he could talk to them about it. And he talks about music and asks, you know, what kind of music do you like? And often people will say like oh you know metal and he'll say oh did you know that the origins of metal is actually in R&B and blues and but that for me is such a beautiful example of how powerful it can be when we listen when we uh, connect with someone with curiosity and empathy with without an agenda that that actually can be really a powerful way of shifting people's kind of fears or biases or assumptions about each other so that's kind of you know taking it to an extreme almost that that it is possible to do that if you kind of strip away all of the stuff and you just talk human to human I've literally got a whole like upper body like oh my god that's like I want to see that I'm going to be yeah. listening back and going to watch that because it's I love that last part you shared that last statement connection without you know, ulterior motive, basically, my words for, for what you just described, you know, just connecting for connection's sake. I want to see you, Liz. Sorry, Lisa, Liz. I want to see you, Lisa, as the whole human that you are and understand you mm. beneath the labels, you know, whether you're, you know, non-binary, black, you know, mm. disabled, you know, whatever your intersectionality is, I want to see you, Lisa. Mm. Like, who are you? Like, and that's, you can't do that without being curious, without an ulterior motive. I just don't believe that you can. So mm. that's, that really came up powerfully for me as you were describing that. So I want to thank you for that. That was. Mm. Yeah, I think I, I really like how Otto Sharma phrases it as well with theory, you and the kind of idea of 
presencing, you know, kind of going down the you and that requires, you know, generative listening where you're just listening with no agenda, no intention. And you see what emerges, you see what comes up, what can uniquely come up between those, you know, those two human beings that could not come up anywhere else, you know, and we're so like, humans are so interesting. Like a, a book that really inspired me years ago was this book, Social, Why, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Connect by Matthew Lieberman. And he did a lot of like neuroscience research or pulled it together that shows that our brains don't know the difference between social pain and actual pain. So if you and I are in a meeting and I say something and you dismiss what I say, for example, my brain interprets that in the same way as if you slapped me or were threatening to punch me. You know, my brain registered it in the same way, like, oh, it's a threat. Mm -hmm. And that means my brain kind of shuts down and I go into my kind of reptilian fight, flight, freeze mode. So I can't think anymore. My prefrontal cortex isn't working. I can't be creative. I can't think rationally. And I think so often that's what we're doing to each other in, in workplaces or in you know, in any kind of conversations in life where, where we're talking about something where people have different opinions, perhaps, or don't feel fully safe, or, um, yeah, when it's a tricky subject, we're kind of talking in a way that everyone's brains are shutting down, and then we're trying, you know, surprised when we can't get to any kind of agreement, or when we can't move forward in any meaningful way, but that's why, because we're not you know, to get out of that, to kind of bring that part of the brain back online requires listening, requires, you know, people feeling seen and heard and taken seriously. Um, so I think that's been like a key learning for me in recent years. It's like, I'm really interested in what are the human skills uh, and kind of mindset shifts that are needed for us to really um, be with each other in this new way, like, I think Margaret Wheatley called it like that we haven't learned how to be yet in this new age of relationships. So that's something I'm really interested in. It's like, how can we help ourselves, each other to do that? Because it's tough and we're so, I don't know if we're trained out of it and we have it inherently or we need to learn it, but some kind of learning process needs to go on anyway. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I'm now looking down. I knew this had happened. I'm looking down at the clock and going like, how much of your time do I have, Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have anything planned, so all the time in the world. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> uh, where I'd like to go a little bit now is take this beautiful exploration towards some of your work with self-management, because I'm sure it's highly relevant. You know, what have you seen? I mean, I'm curious. Have you seen a particular increase in interest in manager-less or self-managed type approaches over the last 12 months as beliefs have been shattered? Has that been an impact at all? And it's just purely a, 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 a straw I'm grasping at, but I'm really curious if that has actually had an impact. Yeah, I think it's hard to know because I've, I've felt like over the last few years, there's been an increasing appetite for these ideas anyway. So it's hard to know if that's been accelerated over the last 12 months or not. Um, and I don't know if, it seems to me more like people, organizations are maybe going to end up on that path, but coming at it from maybe a more practical functional angle. So for example, at the start of the pandemic, some colleagues and I were running trainings with like hundreds of people across the world on how to have better remote meetings, which is quite a kind of functional thing. And we were just sharing some tools about how you can facilitate meetings in a more involving way and how you can use, um, you know, collaborative tools to, to make them more interactive and, you know, things like that. But what came up was a lot of people's, you know, real big questions about, um, you know, people burning out. Again, like I said before, this kind of question of how do we how do we maintain our bonds as teams, our relationships together? How do we, you know, people are feeling really lonely. Like, how do we make sure that people still feel connected 
when we're working remotely. Um, and a lot of HR professionals were sharing, like, I feel at a loss because, you know, we, we were organizing lots of social events, like come and join the virtual pub quiz or, you know, this coffee thing or whatever. Um, but engagement and, and people turning up was kind of going down and down and down. And they were really uh, worried, like, what do we do? What do people need? And so I think um, just the nature of meetings, for example, like how, how we have, I think many of us now are pretty well versed with tools like Zoom um, compared to before. Um, I mean, I've been working on remote teams for the last few years, but I know a lot of people have had to learn very quickly how to use tools like that. Um, and, and using that also as like a bit of a Trojan mouse <laughs> into more decentralized, more collaborative ways of working in the sense of like, you know, when we have a meeting, it doesn't have to be the manager that drives the meeting. It doesn't have to be the manager that um, is responsible for the agenda. So there are like very simple little tools you can use to get people to co-create the agenda or to have a rotating facilitator role. And all of these things seem kind of like, you know, pretty unsexy and uninteresting, but they're little subtle nudges towards, you know, like on one end of the spectrum, there's sort of that all the way up to like self-managing organizations, which is what I'm interested in. But I'm also interested in like everything in between and in general, like just how can people be more involved and be more human? So I don't really have a judgment anymore of like self-management is the way to go. And if, if you're anything less than that, then you're just old fashioned or whatever. You know, that's not my belief anymore. I think it was like, you know, going back to maybe 2015 or something. But now I realize that every organization is different and people are on different trajectories and people, you know, develop and evolve at different paces and it will depend what your context and purpose is. But I think if all of us can become more conscious as individuals and as teams and as organizations, then however we're structured or organized, doesn't matter so much to me compared to whether or not it's conscious, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> That's such an interesting point. You've got me pondering now because I've had my moments definitely in the last couple of years where I've been accidentally judgy. It's like, it, why? It might polarize in my own way. It's like, why aren't we doing Like, as you know, I still work in a big corporate. A lot of people forget about this. I still work in <laughs> hairy three and a half billion turnover corporate. And we've done our own little version of a self, exactly as you're describing, you know, over three years, you know, we just changed, like we co-created the values. We mm. changed how we did meetings. We made yeah. sure that we considered that we had European colleagues and that maybe English isn't their first language. We changed the pace of delivery, like some really simple little nuances, but we added 6 million in sales and a half, million and a half in margin over three years. And we can track that because we're a mm. sales team, but nothing else changed Lisa, apart from literally intentionally getting rid of the power from one person and actually having other people co-create it. So I just wanted to bring that for the listener as a really real life, simple anecdote that we aren't far from a self-managed company, but we've got very real tangible results of our little baby steps towards relinquishing power, I guess is probably the simplest way of putting it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Or I think sharing power, I think. Mm. And, um, I'm very inspired by Helen Sanderson. I don't know if you know her or you know her work. She's yes. the founder of Wellbeing Teams. Yes, sorry, absolutely. Yes, yes, mm. yes, yes. Yeah, and she she and I did a, a talk for leaders of cancer organisations last year, I think. And um, we were really trying to think about, like, how can, what sort of relevant and accessible to that audience, because many of them are in quite traditional organisations, small and large and, you know, with minimal resources often, uh, so kind of whole hog self-managed organization is maybe a big stretch right now, but what are the pieces that could be meaningful for them? And Helen really helped me articulate like a couple of really simple kind of practical things. And one of them is just starting with, um, you know, st working with your team on what gets in the way of the team doing their best work. Um, and that kind of, to me, sounds like a little bit where, the inspiration in, in your organization came from like just kind of nudging a couple of things and seeing like you know what are some things we can try 
And that comes from Aaron Dignan and the Ready and their um, tension and practice cards and the OS canvas. And I really like that, just taking taking something, you know, like eating the elephant one bite at a time, saying like, what's one thing that really stops us from doing our best work? I don't know, having inefficient meetings or uh, not being clear how decisions are made. You know, like one of those things, take one of them and then explore, all right, what could that look like if we designed it to, to help us, you know, do our best work? What could we try? What could we experiment with? Um, and I think that's a really nice way into, uh, you know, and it, you may not end up being self-managed, but like you said, you'll end up with some meaningful difference or worst case scenario, you'll learn something, it'll fail and you'll learn, <laughs> you know, you'll have a learning moment. So I like that idea of, of just starting with like what gets in the way of you doing your best work. It's really interesting, actually. So again, back to our mutual friend, Perry Timms, one of the things that I adopted after seeing his hackathon approach, which of course comes from agile, agile working. So I'm far from like, I, I, I read enough and then go and experiment. That's just the way I am. That's my curiosity. Like, I don't go too deep. I just take enough and go and go down rabbit holes, Lisa. <laughs> Um, but I've used that hackathon approach exactly like really, really simply in my organization. So what's working well, what isn't working well, what are your suggestions to improve as a grounding for running most of the meetings that we now have. And it's completely transformed the level of engagement and the energy that's in the room because it's totally become a co-creative process. And it's just literally as simple as that. And I, I've told Perry many times about that, that had I not have learned about a hackathon, I wouldn't have realized, oh, I can adapt that to my context. Mm. And that's how we now run meetings most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's why I like liberating structures so much as well, because when I came across them, I I really liked that idea of coming at kind of culture change from habits, you know, the things that we do every day, how we have discussions, how we brainstorm, how we get to a decision that you can have this, you know, suite of 33 different little microstructures you can have in your phone, because I've got the app, the free app on my phone. So if I'm like, right, we need to like tackle this kind of tricky issue with this group, or we need to review what's happened in the last six months. And I type into my little app, like, right, we've got like 45 minutes or I'll sort by the purpose is this, or, and then boom, I've got a little step-by-step -step guide of how I can facilitate a conversation in a way that's really collaborative, where everyone shapes the outcome of that discussion, where participation is really distributed. So that for me was like a real turning point of like, oh, wow, I can just build little strings of liberating structures and completely transform the way that I interact and have meetings and discussions with people. And it, I don't have to do a facilitation training course or anything to do it. I can just follow these little steps and try them out. That's so cool. So cool, right? We're gonna. I'm gonna to have to take you to wrapping up because otherwise it's nearly the weekend, and I would feel guilty <laughs> to have you for another hour, as easy as that would be. So, I've got a little question, if I may, random question. Yeah. Sorry, jumping over the plate. I'm really intrigued in this moment, Lisa. Like, what was the shift for you? So I'm jumping back a little bit. You said there was. You used to have that belief that self-managed was like the way to go. If you're not doing self-managed, then maybe it's suboptimal. My words, not yours. What shifted for you? What was going on? What, what happened with you over the last few years? Or has, has something, is it experiential? Is it different experiences, different companies you've met? I'm just wondering what the shift was for you that, you're take, that you've got this different sensing around self-management, mm. maybe than you had sort of five, six years ago. Yeah, I think, I think many of the shifts in my thinking have come from conversations and people um and so I, I can share two examples one one person who's challenged me a lot over the last few years is um tom nixon and his uh work with source um and so when he and i first talk, started talking i just read reinventing organizations and i was like on this you know high of like teal organizations that's the way we've got to do that um and then he was talking to me about, yeah, but I've been like learning about source and this guy, Peter Koenig, and the idea that there's always one person who has like the vision and is the source of an initiative. So there's this paradox of, of leadership that's needed in order to have like a group of people organize around an idea or something. I was like, 
but wait, that sounds like a hierarchy and hierarchy is evil and we must smash them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that, but I, but I've leaned into over the years, like now I get quite excited when something, when I notice like a resistance in me where I'm like, but, but no, then I'm like, aha, that's interesting. Like, let's, let's learn more about that. I think holacracy was another one of those things where I was like, hmm, this seems like kind of cold and not very human to me. Like, let's learn more about that. Let's not form an opinion yet. Let's talk to people, let's experience it. And then I think the second uh, person who's been extremely influential is Karen Tenelius, who's the co-founder of Tough Leadership Training and the co-author of my book. Um, and when I met her, she had the missing piece for me because at the time I was, I had a mindset that it's all about structures and processes. We need to smash down the hierarchical pyramid and then everything will be brilliant. Um, whereas she was saying, well, I've been helping organizations work without managers since the nineties, which was mind blowing to me because I thought this was a new idea. Um, and she said, I don't even touch the structures and processes. Like for me, it's all about, um, a mindset shift from kind of parent-child dynamic in terms of leadership and how we relate to one another towards a more adult-to-adult -adult way of relating to one another. And so my work has been about facilitating different kinds of dialogues and helping people become more conscious of how they're being. And from that, you can build on top of it whatever kind of organizational model you like, you know, agile, traditional, self-managed, whatever but you're starting with a kind of base level of awareness, consciousness, intention. So that really shifted a lot for me, I think. Like, okay, it's about more than structures and processes, actually. And that, you know, if you start with that piece, you know, I do a lot of trainings with um, people. I'll run a training with 20 people in it, and maybe half of them will be from self-managing organizations and half of them will be from really traditional large corporations. And they can be in the same training and get value out of it in different ways, but the principles are the same. And when I spoke to um, an academic, Michael Y. Lee, on my podcast as well about self-managing organizations, and I asked him what makes a good leader in a self-managing organization, and he said, well, the same things that make a good leader in a traditional organization, right? It's about being, you know, coaching, empowering, self-aware, et cetera, et cetera. So... I think that was a shift for me as well, was like, you know, there's no blueprint, there's no software package you can install for, for these shifts to happen. It's like an inner shift first. And, and like I said, if, if that happens and people are conscious, even if they're consciously in a traditional top-down organization, I think that's okay. And, you know, maybe not everyone is cut out for a self-managing organization or it doesn't make sense for that particular organization's purpose. And isn't that the principle of self-organization? Like, wouldn't it be a bit ironic and hypocritical if I said, no, it has to be this way? <laughs> like, <laughs> so, yeah. Brilliant. That's so amazing. I've got so many other questions, but I'm not going to, like, I'm not going to hold you hostage, honestly, it's just absolutely brilliant. And just so many amazing humans and invitations to not only connect and follow with Lisa, but all of these people that she's mentioned, you've been so generous with not only resources today, but actually some really actionable practices that people can take away. You know, they can go and practice running their meeting different or asking for help without worrying about having all the answers. You know, you've just yeah. really offered so much actionable insight today. So I really, Appreciate that, Lisa. How can people find you? What's the best channels through which to, to make contact should they want to follow up with you? Yeah, uh, well, I'm on Twitter. My handle is at Disrupt and Learn um, or via LinkedIn or via my website, which is reimagineer.com. Yeah, those are probably the three easiest places to find me. Amazing. Well, I will make sure they're all in the show notes as well. And I did not pay you to use the word consciousness and it came up a fair few times. So I'm really pleased <laughs> that there was some sort of link today. Um, no, I, I, I just think for me, what was really fascinating as my final, like one of the things I took away really powerfully was that again, that like I say the structures, the processes, they are helpful for humans to deliver an outcome. They are not the thing in and of themselves. And I think even I can get 
wrapped up sometimes in the structure or the idea of creating something without forgetting why we're creating the something if that mm. makes sense <laughs> yeah definitely yeah i think for me it's like a both and thing you know like they're definitely important but they're not the cure all what a way to finish lisa thank you for your time today thank you i really enjoyed it take care